So welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm aware that you have a different accent today. My name is Stephen Weiber. I'm manager for policy and advocacy at IFPA. I'm standing in for Don, who will hopefully be joining us later, but unfortunately, well, probably fortunately for him, is just getting off a plane in France to spend a cut, spend some time in spend some time there. So today's session, um, we've got a it's a really Apposite, a really a, a really good focus for us this week on equity, access, and inclusion at the library, and we're very happy to be welcoming um, Pat Lasinski, who's the Chief Executive Officer at Columbus Public Library, Columbus, Ohio, and Katarina Isbury, who is the Library Director at Helsingborg City Libraries in Helsingborg in Sweden. So, to give a little introduction, I'm sure that many of you here have been to sessions before. Um, this session has been organized kindly by the Gigabit Libraries Network, and that's the organization run by Don, Don Means. Um, it's hosted and recorded by us at the International Federation of Library Associations Institutions. And we work together, Don really puts together these sessions, and then we make sure that they're made available to you afterwards on the Gigabit Libraries uh, pandemic response page. Um, as in previous sessions, we're very happy that the session has been sponsored by Kelly Dry and Warren LLP, which is uh, uh, which work in Washington a lot around helping libraries make use of funding to support connectivity in the US. Um, so as said, um, we've got Pat Lasinski and Katarina Isperi, and we're going to be focusing on the subject of equity, access, and inclusion in the library. Now, it's going to be a slightly shorter introduction than usual. I'm sure you're all following the COVID news at the moment that looks hopeful um, in terms of vaccinations continuing, at least in many countries. We've seen some very encouraging news from the G7 meeting taking place in the UK at the moment about commitments to give hundreds of millions of vaccines to the developing world and hopefully accelerate their rollout in order to make sure that the period of the pandemic is as short as possible. Nonetheless, we're going to be left with some clear lessons from the pandemic. And one, of course, is the importance of digital equity and inclusion. Because if nothing else, we have seen how far those who've connected to a large extent have been able to continue with their lives, with their jobs, with their education, but not everyone has been. So just before getting into, before handing over, I did nonetheless want to show a little bit of data that we have about connectivity and about connections between libraries and access to the internet, because of course, connectivity is one part, at least, of uh, effective digital equity and inclusion. Um, clearly, why we bother talking about this in the first place is the importance of digital equity inclusion as an enabler of individual development. It's what gives people access to it, what allows people to take advantage of the opportunities that there are on the internet, as I said, to work, to learn, to participate in cultural life. Clearly not everything on the internet is positive, but it does enable so much. And increasingly, for example, in the newspaper world, we're seeing newspapers disappearing from print. If you don't have the internet connection, you don't have the newspaper. We also argue that digital equity and inclusion is a precondition for policy success, because so much, with governments so much now trying to move to e-government services, to offer, to offer e-government services, to offer, to offer uh, consultations to offer benefits, to offer support and other services through digital means. If you want people to access these services, grants, other forms of support, it's vital that they're able to actually get online and make use of them. There's no point having, for example, for all we might want to use telehealth as a fantastic way of improving health outcomes. Telehealth doesn't work if you can't tick the tele box if people actually can't get online in the first place. Increasingly, we are seeing the idea that digital equity and inclusion, the possibility to make use of the internet needs to be considered as a human right, but it is increasingly indissociable from the right of access to information, from the right to express yourself, from the right to participate in education, to benefit from science, to benefit from culture. And so we are seeing this, as I said, Already, there was a recognition of the importance of digital literacy inclusion, and this has just been re-emphasized, re-underlined in the pandemic, where we've seen the costs of people not being able to get online. I just want to show, I apologize, these are slightly blurry, just to give some initial data that we've been able to connect to DIFLA. And this looks at the pure connectivity side of things. We did a little bit of analysis 
looking at data available about gaps in internet usage. This is on the y-axis, the vertical axis, compared to the number of public libraries offering internet access. And we looked across a number of different areas. So for example, to what extent is there a gap? How big is the gap between older people using the internet and younger people using the internet? And at least looking in countries with up to around 20 public libraries per 100,000 people, we found that there was this negative correlation, meaning that where there were more public libraries, the gap in access was smaller. Clearly, you can't tell causality from this, but this is a, a notable trend. We looked at the gender digital divide, again, looking in countries up to 20 public libraries, per, 20 public libraries offering internet access per 100,000 people. Once again, it's a slightly smaller, it's a slightly more gentle curve. But again, we tend to see that where there are more libraries offering internet access, there tends to be a smaller digital divide. We looked at the education-related digital divide. So the gap between people with lower levels of education accessing the internet and those with higher levels of ed education accessing the internet. And across all age groups, once again, we found that this gap was smaller when there were more public libraries offering internet access. Finally, we looked the same at the difference between people in work and those who are unemployed, who are retired. Once again, you see that negative correlation. More public libraries means a smaller, a smaller digital divide. Now, these are, of course, as I said, you can't show causality. These are two statistics, two sets of statistics. They appear to line up, which is, of course, positive and encouraging. You can't prove causality here, but and we're going to hear in the course of this session there are so many things that great libraries are doing in order to show this, in order to make this link, to allow people to be better connected despite the fact of having, not, despite the fact of not enjoying necessarily all of the benefits or being on the more favored side of things. However, of course, digitally equity inclusion is about connectivity, but it's also about so much more. And the definitions used in many statistics of connectivity are often actually pretty weak. The speed of connectivity is often set very low. It's often defined as someone who uses the internet once a month, which really isn't quite the same thing as making the full use that you might need for education, for work, for other purposes. So statistics point us in an interesting direction, but they don't get us so far. And in particular, they don't tell us so much about the importance of education, of confidence, of being able to find content. So that's why it's really exciting to be able to talk today to two libraries in the form of Columbus Metropolitan Library, Columbus Public Library and Helsing Valley City Libraries in order to talk about some practical examples, some really excellent examples of libraries going beyond simply connectivity and giving people the sort of access, the possibilities to really make the most of the internet. So there we go. We have two very quick photos. On the left, we have Columbus. And so we're going to start with Pat Lysinski at Columbus. On the right, we have Helsingborg. And um, I will then simply actually hand over to Pat in order to do Pat, who's a, a former IFPA governing board member, um, organized a fantastic conference in 2016 in Columbus, Ohio for us. And I will let Pat you introduce and kick off talking about your experiences what's happening in Columbus in order to promote this inclusion, digital inclusion, digital access. Great, thank you, Stephen, um, for the warm uh, introduction and the welcome to be with all of you today to my European colleagues and beyond. I realize you have better options at 1700 and 1800 hours on a Friday, so uh, thank you for uh, taking the time um, to be with us today. I want to do a screen share here. And let me do that. And um, with about 15 minutes to speak to you today, this really is at kind of an executive summary level. So um, please know that I have links and others in this slide deck, and I told Stephen. The slide deck is certainly uh, available to all of you, so uh, keep that in mind. We're happy to share the resources. Um, just uh, Stephen had one picture. I have to give you a picture of our main library, and those of you who are at IFLA in 2016, uh, just a promise that it generally does not rain every day, so please come back and visit us 
uh, in Columbus. And a reminder, uh, we are serving 23 locations within Franklin County. Here's a map of our service area and the different colors that you see uh, represent uh, new library developments. So we have 16 new libraries or library remodels um, since 2014 and are planning some additional. So we're lucky to be in a community that is investing 220 million in new libraries. And uh, we're very grateful to operate in this community. Our library's vision statement is a thriving community where wisdom prevails. And oftentimes I say to individuals, well, this, this vision statement you know, is not about our library. It's about the impact we hope to have on our library. And if we can help our community thrive uh, and have wisdom prevail, well, you know what? At the end of the day, it is about our library because we need a thriving community in order for our library system to thrive. And when it comes to broadband inequities, uh, I think we really understand that our full community is unable to thrive um, without broadband access. So I think Don Means contacted me about doing this program based upon an article that he ran into in the Atlantic, how libraries are leading the way to digital equity. This was done by De Deborah Fallows. Uh, Deborah and Jim have done a, a book recently, I think called Our Towns, where they visited a number of cities throughout the US and uh, made it a point to make library uh, connections all along the way. And within this article, you'll see a number of um, maps that were created with the help of our uh, digital um, uh, analytic staff uh, and our data analytic staff, excuse me, and um, some GIS mapping that Deb had available to really see uh, and track some patterns around um, the uh, economic demographics of library use as related to uh, computer use within our libraries. And prior to the pandemic, in our 23 locations, we were averaging somewhere between 1.6 1, 1 and 1.7 million uh, reservations to use um, our computers. So it was certainly a space that we were uh, very familiar with. Um, but today I'm not here to just talk to you about the library. I'm here to talk to you about uh, what we call the Franklin County Digital Equity Coalition. And I should tell you that our service area uh, for the library is just over a million and uh, our metro area is now approaching 2.3 million in central Ohio. So the catalyst um, for this effort of the Franklin County Digital Equity Coalition was the response to the pandemic shutdown in March of 2020. It was March 14th. I think by the end of that month, I reached out to the executive director of the Columbus Foundation, our community foundation, which happens to be, I believe, the sixth or seventh largest in terms of assets uh, community foundation in the United States with um, assets uh, over $2 billion. And really to express concern to say, where were all of these individuals going to go who were using public library space? And since all of our uh, uh, libraries had shut down as well, uh, how are we going to support uh, the, the schools that had shut down and the expectation that schools would move to an online environment? So they commissioned a report by an international firm, AECOM, that is available for you to look at. Uh, they turned it around in about four weeks time to really give us a blueprint or a map of where we thought we might need to head. And these are some of the, the basic um, highlights that come out of the executive summary that within our area, more than 100,000 households, not individuals, households uh, who lacked uh, wired uh, home broadband and um, 50,000 with cellular, the other 48 with no home internet service at all. And I, I'm not telling you something you don't already know, the digital divide uh, disproportionately affecting um, individuals of color within our community and everywhere. So this coalition now has been meeting since uh, April of 2020. 
I can tell you it's incredibly grassroots. Uh, there is, there are no bylaws, there are, there is no board, there are no funders, there are no fees to join. We just have every other week, 35 public, private and nonprofit entities. I know we had close to 45 people on the call this past Wednesday meeting uh, every other week um, since May of 2020 with trying to create some long-term solutions for digital equity. And, you know, just recognizing that you see that third bullet integral to achieving economic, educational, racial, and social equity in our community. So paraphrasing here the vision statement, it's a little bit longer, but we're trying to achieve digital equity through universal residential broadband adoption in bold, uh, in quotations, because um, this is not really about availability, because when you look at our metro area, we actually have um, a municipal fiber that crisscrosses our entire county. What's very interesting is that the internet service providers, the private providers actually lay their own cable uh, and, and will will dig the streets and sidewalks up again to actually put um, their own infrastructure in, in place because they want to own it, they want to control it, and uh, they're willing to wait for the permit process to make sure that once it's in the ground, um, there are no other hurdles to go through. So uh, it really isn't about availability. It really is about access. It's about affordability. And the access, um, as we do uh, modeled after Stanford's um, human-centered design as we actually engage our community to find out why uh, they are not connected. Um, you know, one thing, I, we should know this, I should know this, but the extent of the lack of trust around the internet as a resource that people want to be connected to their home um, is somewhat shocking to me. So these are the current priorities of what we call our working group. So broadband affordability and access. Um, once we actually have uh, adoption, we know it's more than just having it. It's also whether or not we have device access. And we have partnered with a, a national organization called PCs for People. We've led numerous drives to repurpose uh, slightly used or sometimes more than slightly used uh, laptops and computers from our uh, business community, our corporate community, higher education, and even individuals. We've had a number of drives to make sure that people also have devices. Um, but then, of course, it's also about digital life skills and technical support and technology literacy. So we have one of our groups that um, has over 60 members who, prior to this coalition forming, I'm not sure they spoke to each other. The library community was doing their own thing, but we have many nonprofits who are doing excellent work. And it's been a chance to uh, look at our work collectively and to determine where the gaps are, or where the redundancies are, where, where we can approve. And then lastly, the fourth working group is around advocacy for broadband funding and policy. And uh, just this week, in fact, on Tuesday of this week, one of the internet service providers introduced uh, late night uh, language into our state budget process to forbid um, municipal broadband options. And um, we don't think there's widespread support for this, but suddenly there is a, uh, a lobbying and advocacy effort that we are leading as well to make sure that is stripped from the budget that will be approved at the end of June. So our coalition structure, I tried just to provide this so that you can see it. So you see it up on the top, that's all 40 members. We have a steering committee. The steering committee is made up of the chairs or co-chairs of each of the areas of emphasis that make up our working groups. And then we have a few additional people added because they just need to be there. So we have about 10 or 12 on the steering committee. They meet on the alternate Wednesdays that the coalition is not meeting. And then we've also made it a point to meet monthly with all of the internet service providers in central Ohio. 
I will tell you that to a to a group or to uh, to a company, they have all asked to be part of the coalition itself. But uh, we have shared with them that uh, they have uh, a constituency of uh, shareholders and stakeholders and business interests that don't align 100% with our goals of trying to make sure that uh, broadband is available to so many unserved groups. So there's a reason some of the ISPs are not serving those groups right now, either some by choice of people not choosing to join others, um, the inability to afford the service that is provided by our ISPs. So to talk to you about two quick projects, we were able to convince the Columbus City Council, which uh, our library is an independent entity, but working with the coalition, we were able to get them to approve a $1.7 million investment to purchase up to 10,000 hotspots to be delivered to uh, K through 12 student uh, households um, to help with the online uh, education expectations. And then another um, uh, two initiatives that we have, our neighborhood scale uh, internet offerings, offering CBRS or citizens band radio service. And I think I have a, another slide that um, uh, some of you may be very familiar with this, but it's somewhat new about the wireless spectrum made available to the public in 2020. And uh, you can see here the, the coverage areas, the investment that is expected. Um, but the two pilots that we have in place, uh, one is on a community center on the south side of uh, Columbus, and another one is on uh, in a low income area on the near east side of Columbus. And each one of the towers that have been installed anticipate serving up to 300 households. And so uh, work is ongoing. One is going a little bit faster than the other, um, but I think we have about 120 households that are being served um, through this service. And we're trying to just have a proof of concept on these pilots to look at potentially expanding that program. And as we talk to other partners in the community, we find that uh, we may be able to use the uh, emergency siren towers that are located uh, roughly a half mile apart throughout the entire county. Uh, so that will streamline and shorten the ability for us to actually install CBRS technology to try to reach some of those households. So what we're doing right now um, in terms of other current activities, we're just trying to be poised for uh, some massive government funding opportunities that may be coming our way, uh, not specifically for uh, broadband, although some are, but really competing with other priorities in our community for other maybe traditional infrastructure. Uh, but we'll, we believe that our coalition offers the best opportunity to have a, a broad swath of community leaders who are raising their hand and talking about the importance in central Ohio. We don't see it necessarily, or, or more than not necessarily, we don't see it as a public utility option. We see it as leveraging um, the uh, investments that our ISPs have made. And I've told you about the meetings with them. And um, most recently, what we're really talking to uh, the ISPs about is uh, their work uh, for the EBB program, which I think brings, um, I want to say 1.7 billion of temporary relief for broadband access until the money is out. And uh, we're working with the ISPs to make sure we get the word out on that. In terms of what's next for us, um, we know this has to grow up from something that uh, today is just very organic. I'm the facilitator for this coalition. Um, but that is among the other responsibilities as the CEO of the library. So we are looking to uh, hire and perhaps fund through our uh, foundation and other sources, a loaned chief administrative officer for the next 90 to 180 days to really take us up to a next level of growth. Uh, we don't want to create a new nonprofit, but to sort of bolt this on to something that's existing. 
and uh, we hope to have that done within the next 10 days or so. Uh, we're very anxious to see the impact of a new internet service provider that has announced uh, silently that they're coming to Columbus. Um, right now, I believe they are in uh, Denver, Los Angeles, Washington, Boston, and New York, largely focused on consolidated uh, communities of poverty, uh, but they're, they have chosen Columbus for a community where they hope to actually um, provide CBRS technology in the home. Uh, at a flat fee, no taxes, no installation, $15 a month, uh, 30 meg um, symmetrical uh, service. So we're very excited to see when Starry actually makes that announcement in our community. We're also looking at uh, assessing the E-rate uh, eligible investments that may be available that go beyond what we've traditionally taken advantage of from US services through the FCC. And then we're also trying to perfect uh, and improve and model a digital navigator program uh, that's really modeled after uh, a really a groundbreaking service by the Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake City uh, library system where it's really about helping uh, individuals in the community sign up for the best digital service uh, to answer their questions and then to also provide the level of technology training that they need for that program. So my last slide here, I believe, is if I'm offering any advice, um, not only get involved, look at where your library can actually lead in this space in your community. Um, collaboration, for whatever reason, seems to happen naturally and easy, easily in uh, Columbus. And so we try to take advantage of that. But I would also say um, broader adoption is going to impact your strategy. Uh, I'm hopeful that we have, other than wireless, that we are serve, someday serving very few people with uh, uh, library provided laptops in our buildings. Um, so how is that program of service going to change uh, if we're successful? And I believe we will be successful but how do you start thinking now about repurposing your assets for more important services? And as we've told our staff repeatedly, we used to be in the library business. Now we are in the business of community recovery, particularly as it relates to education. Uh, sadly, we not only have weeks or months, we have years of remedial work ahead of us to help kids actually reach their potential. And of course, technology training and literacy will be there and uh, you know our role continues to be to advocate for those who don't have a voice, for students, for seniors, and those of low income. So I'm sorry I ran through a lot in a short period of time, uh, but all of those materials are available and more. Stephen has my contact information. I'm happy to follow up with any of you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you so much, Pat. That, that... Uh, that's really fantastic. I, it was a couple of weeks ago we had Patty Wong, who's the, the the incoming president of ALA, on, and she was making a point of talking about how libraries can really be at the, the hub, at the heart of networks of different stakeholders working in order to promote inclusion, digital inclusion in particular. So, not only it's not only California, it's also Columbus as well. I, I, just to check, I, I, I encourage everyone else, of course, to put questions in the chat as well and I won't, I'll only talk a little bit and hand on to Katharina so then we can have a more open question and answer session at the end. It really was the pandemic that brought you all together. You know it did Stephen but I, I, I think the, the thing that we all have to reckon with in the public library community is this has been front and center you know you'd say hidden in plain sight We've known this for years and years. We just didn't have the coalition of advocates. And I didn't spend any time really talking about um, one of the other reasons I think the coalition is successful is guess what? There was an expectation that business would be conducted from home and not everyone who worked in companies had internet in the home. So suddenly we had businesses who were willing to step up and be advocates in this space as well. And, you know, the other story that I like to tell is we, I grew up in central Wisconsin and 
we have a family farm that had been in our family six generations. Well, my father was actually born on that farm in 1925. And he said growing up in the 30s, he remembered after the New Deal program of Franklin Roosevelt, after the Great Depression, there was an electrification, uh, rural electrification initiative. Because in the 30s, 90% of the farms did not have electricity. And by the 1950s, 90% did have electricity. Now, I don't think we can take 14 or 15 years to do what we need to do here, but the model exists in terms of understanding it. And I, I try to advocate at this level to say, you know, if you don't believe this is the fourth utility, those of you who live in affluence, I'm going to shut off your electricity. See how well you do um, with uh, uh, thriving or surviving in society. So, so we have electricity, we have gas or heat, um, we have water and we have broadband. So yeah, I, I, I think it, the, uh, the, the pandemic laid it all bare for all of us. Exactly. And I think it, it's a point we've touched on a few times before, but how you convince business to vote in favor of something, to support something that is a, a public service. Now, obviously this is probably a more fraught debate in the US. But the, the the risk of the risk of um, uh, competition. Oh, my phone's got a little bit weird. Um, I don't know if we've lost him, Catherine. Katharina. Yeah. Oh, he's giving like you the go ahead in the text. Okay, it has. Okay, then I go ahead. Thanks for a great uh, presentation, Pat. It was really interesting. And I would say that uh, there are some differences uh, in Sweden, but there is a lot that is the same, I would say. Now we'll see. So now you should all be able to see my uh, presentation. Uh, Katarina Eisberg is my name. I am library director, as uh, Stephen said, in Helsingborg, Sweden. And I'm also an, a chair of IFLA Division uh, 4 and an IFLA Governing Board member until August this year. But today I'm going to talk about one of the most important subjects as I see it, equity, access and inclusion, the digital inclusion at the library. But to set the floor, uh, Helsingborg is in the southern part of Sweden. And as you can see from this uh, picture, Sweden is quite a long country. And Helsingborg is in the south, uh, close to Denmark. And we are not as large as Columbus, Ohio. We have 150,000 inhabitants. Uh, and in Sweden, the cities aren't that big or that large. So this Helsingborg is the number eight city in Sweden. So in Sweden, it's a quite a large city. We have a digital library. We have a main library. We have nine library branches and one bus. And something that's interesting with our work is that we organize our work according to what we are doing, not where we are working. So we have five departments, read, search, we only work with the digital inclusion, meet for the meeting place, the digital library and media, and the support department. And we also have a collaboration between 11 towns and cities in the northwestern part of Scania that is called Helsingborg Family Libraries. And as many cities, Helsingborg is developing and evolving with growing population, new city districts and changed social structures. And we as a library need to change and see um, the opportunities and ch challenges in this. And the digital divide is something that is closely tied to the work that we are doing at the library. But we're also really, really into innovation, involvement and 
participation. That's key in our work. And uh, our work in this area is constantly being developed and we are part of the city's ambition to be one of the most innovative cities in Europe. And last year, we were among the five runner-ups for the I Capital Award as we in Europe Innovative Capital Award. And as part of this work, we are also trying to co uh, collect all our innovations that we're doing in something that we call Age 22, Helsing Boy 22. And that's a welfare initiative for the future. And next summer, you're all, all more than welcome to Sweden because then we will have a city expo, which will be large, huge, I would say, uh, where we will show all of our innovative solutions for urban development and welfare. And of course, we will showcase some of the library works as well. We are in this project working on improving the quality of life for our citizens, and we are reinventing city governance. But if we move back to the library, the library mission is to give everyone free access to information and knowledge, create inspiring meeting places, work to promote reading, and work with digital inclusion. And the why, why we're doing this is, is, of course, to secure freedom of opinion and of expression and also to secure participation in the democratic society. And the picture that I choose to this slide is actually saying something, because this is the Swedish welfare uh, web uh, service, where you can get all the health information that you need. And early during the pandemic, this service said, don't call us, use the web page. And when we heard that, we realized that there are so many people that can't use the web page and they have to find that help somewhere. We need to keep our libraries open as long as we can. And if we look at the pandemic and the Swedish libraries, I'm sure that you have heard especially in the beginning that we were not doing anything in Sweden. Uh, well, we were, we were doing a lot, but when it came to the libraries, we have a quite strong library law, which states that we have to keep the libraries open. Uh, so we have mainly been able to keep our libraries open. We have had a lot of services closed. We have not been able to be a meet, meeting place, for example. We have removed all furnitures. We have had plexiglass, so a lot of it all over the place. And we have really been trying to minimize what you can do in the library. And in order to be able to do this, we have had to think in new ways. We have had to develop our services and we have had to be really innovative, both in the digital arena and also in the physical arena. And as a library, you know, all of you, that we give access to information, literature, and knowledge. We get, give access to technology. And here you can see some of our robots that we are using in our work. Uh, but most importantly, as I said, we do give access to the expertise of the library staff. And in Sweden, one million Swedes, that's 10% of the population, are outside the digital society. But at the same time, 98% of Swedes have access to internet. But having access, that's not enough. Having access to and mastering the technology, those are two different things. And we see that every day at the library. And we see the socioeconomic aspect, as Pat uh, also talked about. We see that it's older people, but we also meet younger people, young people, young adults, and adults in general. And we also see new in Sweden. And our solution on this was 
our Digital Competence Center, our DigiDL, which we opened three years ago. We opened it as a project together with the city's digital department. Uh, now it's not a project any longer, it's in our ordinary business. And if I took this picture today, it would look totally different because this was uh, before the pandemic. Now it's more space between the computers and there are no desks or uh, chairs where you can sit and study, unfortunately. I hope we will be able to go back to that. But the DigiDL, our Digital Competence Center, want to increase digital inclusion among the inhabitants and give everyone the opportunity to get access to information, get involved in the development of the city's services and promote the use of digital services. And we also want to be an arena where the city can collaborate and meet the inhabitants so that the different city departments meet and can test their new uh, digital uh, services, for example, together with the inhabitants. And this uh, actually, the digital, the digital Competence Center gave us it, uh, a spin off. We became part of the European Union Urban Agenda Digital Transition Project. And uh, this is a um, multi level partnership between cities. And in this work, among other things, we provided this model and toolbox to establish a digital competence center. And this is actually a booklet uh, where you can find some tips on how to build your own uh, competence center. And uh, in the booklet, Helsingborg is one of the examples and Sofia in Bulgaria is another uh, example. And three important areas here are the space, access to internet and the devices. And I would actually say that I would pick out the staff and have them as the fourth area if I would uh, do this uh, booklet, because the staff is so important, as I said. During the pandemic, we have seen that the digital divide is really a challenge. We early saw that we have to be able to continue to give this service. People need to find the health information they need. Now they need to be able to book their uh, time to get the uh, vaccination, which is not easy. We need to help them. And uh, one thing that we tried to do was to be, uh, do different things to be able to continue our services as safely as possible. And we could offer some virtual services, of course, and we did some new of those, but at the same time, in order to use the virtual service, you have to have a certain level of digital skills. And we meet so many people that don't have that. They need to come to the library and sit down and get the uh, expertise from the uh, staff. So we made this support station. And here we have two different computers. They are sharing the screen so that the librarian can see what the uh, library user is doing on the screen. And the librarian can safely behind the plexiglass that's in between uh, and on, uh, on the sides, uh, they can sit there and uh, supervise and help the uh, user. And the impact on this was that we could continue to work on the digital inclusion, improve our services, and also find things that we can use after the pandemic. Both the staff and our library users, they love this uh, service. So we will continue with the support station also after. And it's an easy thing, but it, it made a difference. One of our largest problem was that everyone started to do so many digital services and offer dig new digital services when the pandemic started. And of course, that's good for us that knows how to use them. But for those who don't, 
we saw in the library that we uh, had many digital excluded visitors. We met new and familiar visitors that needed much more help than the users we had before. And we needed to adjust our services. And our solution on this was collaboration. So we are working together with different departments within the city to try to make a new future DigiDeal 2.0. So a new digital competence center. And what we want to do in this is to reach new library users, to improve our services as well as other department services make better use of the competences and the resources within the city and also what we see is that people start to understand what the library is what a modern library is we are not reaching the goal all the way but at least it, it becomes better they start to understand why we are working on the, with the digital inclusion for example and i really think it's important to share what you are doing and learn from others and therefore we uh, sent in one of the projects that we are working on to the ifla library map of the world and i would really like to ask you all that if you have any projects that you are working on, then you should add them to the library map of the world. And in here you can uh, read about how we have been uh, working on closing the digital gap for elderly citizens. I also think that we need to connect what we're doing with international, national, regional and local regulations, manifestos, strategies, and so on. And for example, when we talk about the digital divide, I usually show this picture because I think that it's important to connect it to the IFLA global vision, the highlight number four, which says we embrace digital innovation. And the opportunity here is we must keep up with ongoing technological changes. And for example, our robot that's shown on the side here, when we bought it three and a half years ago, it was quite new. Now it's probably quite old. Things move very fast in this uh, area. But we don't stop our work with this. We are building for the future. So we are looking into how we can ensure that we are really in all of the city, not only in the city center, but also in the uh, countryside. We are moving beyond the library walls, as many other libraries are doing. We try to be as much as possible in other uh, buildings than the library. And uh, we are also starting a large investigation on how the library structure should look like in the future. And at the same time, we are happy enough that we are in the planning process of building a new city library, a new main library. And uh, in this, we want to create a place for relaxation and learning where the inhabitants meet or inspired develop and create together for the future. And we are in this really using involvement and participation and asking the inhabitants a lot on what they need in the future. And we have a brand new dialogue tool that the city has provided where we can meet with the inhabitants in the digital arena but of course we also do a lot of workshops and uh, things where we meet them in the physical space as well and we hope to be able to do that much more when the pandemic is getting better i have provided some links 
for some uh, further reading if someone is interested. And what I would like to send to all of you is to continue to create libraries where people meet, get inspired, develop and create together for the future. And the libraries are for all. Thank you so much, Katerina. I hope this is, yes, this is now working again. I apologize for dropping out earlier. That's a fantastic presentation. It's great all that's going on and that you've got these, you've been sharing it as well, which is the most important thing. I guess, uh, as before, I really encourage everyone to use the chat function to, to, to ask questions. And then, of course, I'll be more than happy to call on you to, 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 to raise your hands, to, 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 to speak out, um, out loud. I guess what one question I had listening to that is a, an issue we often hear about is that um, obviously for library staff to be able to offer support, especially to people who may be scared of the internet, as, as Pat mentioned earlier, or who really feel uncomfortable while using it. Um, do um, How have you gone about ensuring that staff themselves have the skills, the competence, the confidence to do that effectively? We are really been working a lot with the training of the staff and we are happy because uh, the or lucky because the Royal Library of Sweden has uh, made a digital tool that where all the Swedish uh, library staff can go and they can do some training within the digital uh, arena, but also before that was available, we had uh, different um, as presenters and different uh, workshops and so in the library and also the ones that are really good at something they train their colleagues so if then they for example they have been working with literacy and one of the robots then they can invite interested interested colleagues to um, take part of a workshop where they can learn how to use the same robot so they learn from each other and in, in fact, the, the same question would be interesting to, to Pat if, because I know that, again, the, the library, if, if we are going beyond the simple idea of a library being a place where you can access a computer that is connected to the internet, and rather you're thinking about how do you actually you know, empower is a loaded word, so we shouldn't use it, but how do you make sure that users do have the skills, the confidence to do things? You need staff to help. I'm not sure. If Yeah, Stephen, I, I, I think it just, um, it, it's a difference about whether or not we're going to be um, passive or active. And I think the, you know, the difference is maybe a um, library that I grew up with or started working in many years ago was one where uh, we responded if asked. Now I think it, it just has to be a, a very different approach where um, we are out selling that expertise. And you know we also have to make sure that we're developing enough of that expertise within our own people so that they're able to deliver. And I think one thing that we um, perhaps don't talk enough about that I think is one of our critical assets is we have the ability to facilitate the work of other organizations within the by leveraging the library's physical and digital assets, we can help other organizations who do similar work. Uh, they can do it better if we have partnership with them. So sometimes we say, well, how can we possibly do this work? Our staff are so busy already. Maybe it's about bringing others in to actually do that work in our locations. So it's just about thinking about it differently than than we have and and creatively. I think that, that you're completely right. I think it's definitely something we hear in Europe, in the US, elsewhere. The idea of libraries not trying to be the provider of everything. I know there's a again, it's an issue that, that gets plenty of debate going that libraries try to do everything and try to be jacks of all trades, but of course. If you're a jack of all trades, you're also a master of none. So 
working out how you can complement, how you can add in is so important. We had a, a couple of questions which are sort of, I, unless I've misunderstood them, are, are semi-linked in terms of this thinking about how you reach out and how you understand the needs of users. So Stephen Abraham has mentioned beyond digital skills, do you do cross-cultural training and social service and anti-poverty acculturation? And then Amy L has asked Katerina in particular about the new dialogue tool provided by the city to connect with community members and how these how this works. So Katerina, do you want to go first on that? Yeah, I just uh, posted a link uh, on the dialogue tool. It's unfortunately in Swedish, but uh, hopefully Google Translate will uh, help us. Uh, it's brand new. And uh, when it started, the city decided that five different uh, uh, projects were going to be part of it. And the news main library was one of those. And uh, it's a tool that when you log into it, you can make different, you can make workshops and you can uh, have uh, different questionnaires and things like that. Uh, but it's also a place where you can post what you find in the different uh, interventions that you do with the, with the inhabitants and the users. So it's a way to uh, both showcase what you have uh, seen in the different um, uh, involvement uh, activities. And I must say that we did uh, actually uh, hire a, a skilled person, an expert within this field uh, a year ago in order to really be able to work with um, design thinking of libraries in a very uh, professional way, much more professional than we have been doing it uh, earlier. And I guess then to pass in particular on the, the topic of these that you already talked about doing carrying out research and understanding why people weren't connecting, what, what were the underlying factors, to what extent was their training, was their work within the library as well? I'm sure it's there latently, but to, to actually understand these cultural issues, cross-cultural training. Yeah, I, I would, a couple of things I would add here. I, uh, uh, the first is that uh, we, we find ourselves partnering often with the community foundation because I think they see the aspect of community that flows through the public library system. So when they think about community issues, you know, we can call ourselves libraries, but we all know that we're community centers these days as well. And um, they had a they had sponsored um, during the pandemic um, an opportunity for nonprofits to apply to be in extensive training with Stanford University on this human-centered uh, design. And we're really big on it because um, I think as we, we look back, what we find is that we have well-intentioned people working in our libraries who really don't understand the needs and challenges of some of the users that we're trying to help. And some of those individuals feel overwhelmed by the number of people who are trying to help them and frankly get it wrong. So it, it's really shifting our focus to say we need to start. And, and I know Stephen asked about cultural literacy and cultural sensitivity. Uh, of course, in the US right now, so much work being done around racial equity. Um, you know, the, the challenges and expectations of a of a well-prepared library staff member, I don't think have ever been greater in my entire time of working in library. And yet someone put in the, the chat, the notion of, of uh, what was the word that was used here or phrase, something about um, creating, oh, uh, to practice radical trust. Well, to, to practice radical trust, we need to be radically prepared. And, you know, so you say, well, how, how do you how do you find this balance between the work that needs to be done and the education and the preparation to be able to meet our community where they are, not where we think they are, and and that's just a big shift for us. And you know we we talk we we put this under the umbrella of digital equity. Um, that's not equality. Equity is something else, 
and that takes a different level of sensitivity. And uh, I think libraries have the ability to lead in this space because of the amount of trust that we have already. But um, I can tell you every day I'm challenged to think, are we doing enough in this space to really meet the needs of our um, very diverse community? Sorry, I uh, rambled on a bit there. <laughs> I would just like to add to that, that uh, I really think that we should uh, be careful on assuming that we know that uh, what the library uh, users need. Uh, before we had the customer, the digital customer um, uh, competence center, we had a lot of computers all around the library, as most libraries do. Uh, and when the city was going to make a new service policy a couple of years ago, uh, we were one of the projects where we were involved in making a customer journey uh, mapping. And we made that uh, customer journey mapping on the library um, uh, computers and the public library computers and how those were used. And one of the main findings that we saw was that when you come to the library, you are already uh, feeling outside because you have to go somewhere to get the help that many people can uh, uh, get the, uh, at home. And then when you came to the library, all the, the computers, they were placed so that the staff could pass behind your back to see that you were not uh, doing any pornographic surfing or anything like that. Uh, and because of that, you were doubled uh, actually the feeling that someone were watching you and you were uh, outside the um, uh, community. So that was the first thing that we changed, how we placed the library uh, computers and that we were trusting our uh, library users. That Because most people, they are not using them for uh, pornographic surfing. And uh, then we actually built our the entire digital competence center around the findings from that survey. And then we have done that uh, several times to uh, develop it further. Thank you. It, it, it feels like there's probably actually a fantastic bit of work to be done just gathering together all of the lessons from libraries of trying to think about how you can move from digital equality to digital equity. I, I try to avoid using the, the, the graphic that everyone uses on equity and equality involving fences and boxes um, because it gets overused anyway. But how do you actually, you know, this is really valuable experience and there's not so many organizations that can bring it together at such a scale as libraries. So I, I'm conscious we're over time. Um, what Don tends to do, and, and given that I don't think he's been able to Join me, I apologize, the dog is getting excited next to me here. Um, yep. Um, so what Don tends to do at the end, which I think is just a nice idea anyway, is given that if we were in person uh, at the end of the session, we would be applauding our speakers. The suggestion is that we should do the same here. So I'm going to ask everyone to unmute. Um, I, I can't sort of promise it only sort of checks as whooping in the way that Don would do it. I, I don't, I'm British, I don't whoop. Um, but I would just encourage everyone to give our speakers a round of applause. So thank you both. We will stay on the line for a little bit. I'll stop the recording though in a minute. Um, for our regulars, uh, we're going to take a couple of weeks break at least on the webinars. So look in your inboxes for information about the next call. And in the meanwhile, thanks again, Katerina. Thanks again, Pat. And I wish you all a very good next couple, hopefully next couple of weeks, summer, wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>